It is Saturday, October 29th, 2011, and I'm with Audrey Waters, the blogger and writer for our weekly chat about all things ed tech. Audrey, do you want to add to that bio at all? Oh, that's a good bio. I think that as we sort of move through the move through the topics, we might want to add a uh, troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> So I really enjoyed reading your blog posts and the roundup this week. Um, I want to start with the uh, Startup Weekend EDU. Yes. Uh, this, I think, uh, was in Washington, D.C., and was it your fourth? It, it was. I've traveled. I've been to two of these events um, in San Francisco, one in Seattle, and then this one in Washington, D.C., which is very interesting sort of. Um, think of it sort of as a technology anthropologist, if you will, to look and see sort of what happens in these different um, communities in terms of the um, entrepreneurs, in terms of the engineers, and the educators that are present. So D.C. was interesting. Well, and it sounds like in D.C. there were more educators present. Yes, they made up. I think they. I think that they've realized that if if they're going to sort of escape, you know, the sort of Silicon Valley bubble, if you will, in which people are sort of building technology solutions for problems that nobody actually has, um, that they need to get, you know, they need to have, they need to have educators present and they need to really support, um, support the teachers in sort of saying what their problems are and helping them um, drive uh, building the solutions. So I want to be a little bit of a contrarian here. Uh, Jim Shelton uh, from the Department of Ed you're, you quote him in the in the piece on the Startup Weekend. He said, when teachers talk to – is it Jim? Yes. Yeah. They're friends, he says, and they see what actually works. They actually adopt new tools quickly. Okay, that led me to make a connection with this piece and your piece on Yongo Pal, mm-hmm. um, in which tech companies pivot or need to pivot. And I'm thinking of also like Flickr and Twitter and the degree to which Web 2.0 companies end up themselves being canaries in the coal mine, showing us how radically companies have to change to meet customer expectations. And in thinking about those companies and think about their adoption in education and thinking about Ning, it occurred to me that a lot of these companies actually don't focus on education. They focus on sort of core human needs and get adopted by educators and then in particular get adopted by kind of cutting edge educators who reshape them to match sort of existing pedagogical issues or or figuring out how to use them in ways that seem like they make sense for teaching and learning. So the big question for me is, does it even make sense to be thinking about creating products just for education? Is that kind of a red herring? I think that that's, I think that that's a really, I think that's a really good question. And I would say, um, yes and no. I mean, I think that you're right. I think that you know some of my most favorite uh, tools that I, you know, that are sort of what productivity tools. I've seen great adoption in the classroom. Evernote is a good example. Dropbox. Neither of these are really designed for uh, use in schools, and yet um, people have found that they are precisely the tool that they need. Um, you know, rather than building a specific. Uh, specific tool to sort of share files between teachers. Teachers gravitate to the consumer tech. But at the same time, I have to wonder if that consumer tech model is going to fail to solve a lot of the problems, the real sort of specific nitty-gritty problems that a classroom teacher has, um, partially because it just, it, it's just might not appear to be a big enough market, partially because, you know, some entrepreneurs Actually, a lot of them have no idea what it means to to be a classroom teacher, and I think that there are you know that there are ways of thinking through you know how can we, and even if it's not a business, you know that's one of the things that I, I've noticed with startup weekends is a lot of these pro- things that are being built they probably aren't a startup they probably aren't a business they're an interesting feature or an interesting tool that someone can use, um, but I think that there's still something worth thinking through how can we answer a specific problem that a classroom teacher has that a, that an engineer in, um, isn't going to necessarily even know that that's a problem. That makes a lot of sense to me. As you're speaking, it also occurred to me that in my mind I've kind of divided um, some of this into two camps, one of which is that which gets created for educators and is kind of mandated in its use, and that which educators do after hours 
because they're it's it's sort of humanly interesting to them, and then it sort of expands their capabilities. And I and I wonder if if, if sort of separating them in that way doesn't make a little bit of sense, um, because the moment you you sort of create something for educators and it becomes a part of the the school mandated process, will it actually then uh, be harder because it's just one more thing to do? Well, I think that th- I think that that's a huge issue, and and I mean we notice we see this all the time with sort of these tools that are supposed to uh, make things better, and I, and I mean that really genuinely, generally, make things better in education that actually require a ton more work for, for teachers. So if a teacher is already required to sort of keep their grades in one um, system, to have to actually duplicate, you know, duplicate the clerical work into another system that might be neater or nicer looking, it's actually a huge, I mean, I think that that's a huge barrier to teachers wanting to use these tools. In the open source world, we called this the principle of non-displacement. Open source software programs generally got accepted if they weren't displacing another program. No matter how bad the other program was, just the change involved in going from one way of doing something to another often was enough of a barrier to stop a program from being successful. Yeah. No, I think I think that that's absolutely I think that that's absolutely true. I mean, and that's I think that that's one of these struggles too when we think about building tools specifically for teachers in the classroom, is that a lot of times we're seeing adoption with just of of tech in general with some of these very leading edge teachers. And so, is there going to be enough? Is there sort of enough interest and movement for uh, for people for sort of everyone to sort of pick up one of these new tools that are being built? I don't know the answer to that. So it's a good segue, I think, to Inkling. Yes. Because it feels to me as though this whole question of uh, the book becoming interactive um, is a larger societal issue that will then really translate well into education. But if this were being pitched as an education solution, I don't know that it would get the traction that I feel like these projects are going to get as a general public solution. Yeah, Inkling. I like Inkling a lot. I think that um, you know, as they were one of the one of the very sort of first apps to appear on the iPad, um, and that's perhaps because the co-founder was an Apple for Education employee. But they're really doing something different with the textbook. They aren't just digitizing and turning you know turning a textbook into a PDF. They're really rethinking what a textbook looks like, and the, and the textbook as a genre. Um, is an interesting one because it actually is pretty modular. There's different units, there's illustrations, there's diagrams, there's sort of vocabulary, there's quizzes. And so the, there's something about the way in which a textbook is assembled, even in the printed version, that makes it almost perfect to actually completely re-engineer that and make it into an interactive, an interactive app. Um, that being said, I think Inkling, because Inkling, Inkling has just been very... Uh, sort of slow to get a lot of titles. There's not a lot of titles available on Inkling. And so that's sort of been a barrier to have them be adopted widely, I think, by by schools. Well, so this is interesting. I was assuming that the cookbook was not a school-related uh, book. Um, and for me, for me, the nice thing that it, that it did was it, uh, it creating more glitzy versions yeah. of the book, say for the iPad, and thinking this is a little bit of desperation to keep the publisher relevant. Right. Whereas what I really am looking for is the transformation of the book to a to a an interactive or a conversation starter. Yes. So does, so has Inkling done something really innovative with this cookbook and was it intended for education? Um I think that it I think that I asked them this question because I you know when I first heard that Inkling was was doing a cookbook I thought oh no like this is a great you know this is a, a really interesting um company and are they going to be abandoning the education market for a more sort of general consumer play and they said that they see the cookbook as part of their mission because um, which is a sort of an interesting DIY right a cookbook is actually a how to it's a textbook in some ways, but it is one that you use at home as opposed to in the classroom. Um, but but I think it also is, again, it's this perfect sort of book to be able to include videos, to be able to include explanations um, in ways that, you know, a novel, uh, when you start doing that, when you start uh, transforming a novel in that way, you lose. I mean, this is the literature. This is the literature student speaking here. You sort of lose what a novel actually was. 
Will you talk in your roundup about SimText, uh, the Liquid Text book, and findings? And you know, the first phrase that came to mind for me was social reading. Yes. Which is where we're sharing. And I, again, nobody's asking my advice on this, but I would tell Inkling, figure this out for the larger audience, and education will figure out how to bring it in. But but that that direction makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, this is one of the things that I think is a, you know, a great possibility of digital books in general is this, I'm a big, I'm a big um, right in the margins of my books sort of person. And I love the idea of actually being able to share my margin notes and read other people other people's margin notes, particularly in a classroom setting, whereas, a, whereas an, as an instructor, you can, you can highlight and point your students to particular passages and have sort of discussions around something in the margins of the textbook. I think that's a really powerful idea. I think Inkling is, Inkling is definitely working on that, but SimText is bringing that to more sort of popular fiction. So you can have conversations in the margins of, you know, the Game of Thrones book which is uh, appealing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump us then to Google+, Plus yes. because that seems to me to be one of the great promises of Google+, Plus, which is as soon as there are APIs and hooks into the system, then you can create conversations with people that you care about around something that's public, whether yeah. it's a news story or it's a book. So that's why it was a little sad to me to realize that this kind of uh, – Cognitive dissonance of Google being uh, age eighteen requiring requiring you, you be of age eighteen, and I say cognitive dissonance because probably most of us have let our children get Google yes. accounts. Um, this that's why that story was sort of sad to me. Google Plus just does come to um, to their apps product, apps for education, but only for higher ed. I know, and I I'm, I I um, actually can't get Google to sort of nail down um, when or if even they're planning on changing that age rate, that age um, group. Initially, when it first launched, um, they you know they were you know they promised it's coming to apps for education, but they really won't say if they if they do plan on taking it to the 13 and up. Um, which I think is a shame. I think that there's a lot of things that, that Google is doing right with Google Plus in terms of um, being able to create um, sort of create sort of private groups to share information, and um, I think it's a it's a lost opportunity um, to to make Google Plus a really solid alternative for uh, for schools to sort of get um, get on board with social networking and do so in a in a sort of um, in a sort of safe environment. So I'm going to make a distinction here, and I've thought a lot about this this week because I love Google+. Plus. In fact, it's much preferred for me now from, from Twitter. But uh, people are saying that Google doesn't get social. And, and I want to make the counter argument that I don't think it's that they don't get social. It's just that most of the social that most people want is way too shallow. Yes, I think that's actually really – I think that one of the things that I've noticed um, – uh, thinking, just thinking about how social networks have changed even in the last year or so, particularly in light of what we've seen um, with the Arab Spring, um, I think we're starting to realize that when we say social and social network, that there are all of these different variations. And it really isn't just this personal expression, that, um, that, these, that these new tools are being used as information networks, that they're being used as political, uh, to hold political conversations. And I think that social... Is, I, mean, I think that we've been quick, to, some people have been quick to dismiss social as sort of inane and personal and irrelevant. And I think that what Google Plus demonstrates is that social is actually, can be deeply engaging, conversational, and some of the most um, interesting discussions, I certainly have more interesting discussions on my blog, uh, to my blog posts on Google Plus than I ever have in the comments uh, of the blogs themselves. I can't wait for them to integrate blogger with Google Plus because I again I have the same feeling which I want that conversation that's taking place in Google Plus to be taking yeah. um, you know in some transparent way with the blog. Um, I have to say I love the long form sustained conversation of Google Plus. I and do too. and I'm I'm actually gonna change I don't I don't would not call it a social network now. I would call it a conversation network. Yeah, interesting. That you know for me it's actually distinct and if if that's the social that Google doesn't get, the kind of 
uh, sort of commercial frenzy social, then I'm actually glad they're sticking with the, the way they're doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say, I, I, uh, I'm really enjoying Google+. Plus. I love Twitter. I'm not a big Facebook uh, user. Um, I love Twitter for very short, again, like I was just saying, Twitter seems very informational and newsy. It's not, con- it's very hard or almost impossible to hold a conversation on Twitter. Um, but Google Plus is, is great. And I would say that some of the educators that I communicate with there, I mean, we're, ha- we're having just fabulously in-depth engage- engaging discussions on Google Plus. And all the early Plurk adopters are pointing a finger at us saying, why were you listening when we were talking about that with Plurk? Okay, so quickly, uh, the Children Internet Pro- Protection Act and this gray area of are you filtering the internet at schools or are you actually filtering, having filtering on the computers? Because when that computer gets taken into the home, are the parents prepared for the children to have access to the net? Yeah, this is something that a couple of weeks ago I wrote a story about um, web filtering and a friend of mine from Wyoming left a comment, well, I should say left a comment on my blog saying it's, uh, I'm really frustrated. He's a theater um, arts teacher. He's frustrated because although his school district has a one-to-one laptop program, they just this year started filtering, putting filtering software on the laptops so that when his students take those computers home, they can't access any of the websites they need to do research. Um, in his case, it's because, you know, that, quote, entertainment keyword is um, something that a lot of these filtering softwares flag. Um, and so I thought, well, that's weird because, you know, SIPA doesn't, SIPA says if you get federal funding for um, E-rate, you filter the network. So do you filter the device? And I ran the question up the chain of command at the Department of Ed and got handed over to the FCC and ran the question up the chain of command at the FCC. And the official word is, uh, there's, it's a gray area. There's no official word. <laughs> no the official, official word is, there's no official word. There's no official word. I'll it, tell you anecdotally. Uh, as I've asked this question in interviews over the last two years, it ceased to be less of an issue, but maybe because parents are becoming more familiar with the internet. But it it was a real hot button issue two years ago. I asked it of those who were implementing an iPads in the classroom project, and they said, "Oh no, the parents didn't have any problem with it, uh, with the have kids having access with, to the internet on their device." Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's you know, and I think that it's interesting too because the FCC is really trying to push to get, you know, kids to have broadband access at home. They're starting to fund projects to give students, um, you know, like 3G cards, for example, so that they, you know, even if they don't have internet in their home, that they can have a 3G, uh, 3G access at home. And so I think that this is going to become a really important question for the, for the FCC to, to decide, um, particularly as they're working hard to get um, access at home. But then, the, you know, the flip side of it is, when are we going to stop filtering and start actually teaching students how to be safe on the internet without having to sort of block everything for them? Yeah, we haven't had this discussion before, but uh, I went to an ePals presentation. I really like the people who work at ePals, but they create this really convoluted system of who can email whom within a school district. And it's a, it's a grid that's got to be 20 by 20. And I said to the presenter, how will the kids ever know how to do this on their own if you've done it all for them during their school years? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, you know, that's the thing, too, is, and we, you know, we aren't actually talking about oftentimes the the filtering, you know, the the, the way that SIPA reads is actually sort of um, pornographic content um, and stuff that's, you know, the harmful, harmful to minors content. And what gets filtered is actually far more heavy handed. And so I think we really are missing an opportunity to teach kids how to, um, how to be safe online, how to search effectively, search responsibly, um, and, you know, some, a little bit of savviness about what to click on. Well, and often the sites that get filtered are social networking sites. Right. And you reference a report from the Chronicle of Higher Education about um, the potential value of social networking tools, or Facebook in particular, for uh, you know communicating about assignments. Is is that real? I mean, is 
does Facebook have that value? I think Facebook. I think that Facebook does have that value. I mean, and I think that that's actually it's not surprising if you think about, particularly in higher ed, if you think about Facebook's sort of history. That's where Facebook started was in colleges. So it doesn't surprise me at all that students students don't actually see this divide between social the social network and the study network because these are their friends and their social you know their social circle are the people that they're going to ask for help with i mean that's what they do offline you know that brings us right back to that uh, that divide between our social lives and our school lives Mm -hmm. or social in school or what we do outside of school and what we do in school and i'm wondering if we're not going to continue to find that that um constructed divide is is increasingly going to be seen as one that's not worth sustaining i'm 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 really interested about this too and especially thinking as you see a number i mean actually this brings us back to the first your first point as well you see a number of tools again being created to sort of solve this problem for schools by creating special social networks just for schools and sort of what is it you know what are we what are the trade-offs when we when you decide to adopt in your school a, a social network that's private um, and restricted and no, you can't communicate with anybody outside the school um, versus having a serious art, a serious discussion about what it would look like to let the kids use Twitter or Facebook in that way. There's a deep pedagogical discussion about this artificial distinction between school and life that we will probably come back to. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so data-driven education. This yes. story fascinated me. Four eyes on me, student assessment data, understandable for families. What fascinated me about it was that in other areas, we often see that it's this basic principle of giving the user feedback. hmm like a dashboard kind of a thing or your the way your speedometer tells you how fast you're going or what your gas mileage is in a in a prius that it's the sense that there are some forms of sort of simple feedback that really can modify the user's experience my first reaction and i don't know that was fair was uh, why isn't this being focused on helping the student see their data rather than the parents? And, and did I misunderstand? I think that I think that the idea is to create create the infographic so that it is accessible with both student and parent. Because I mean, I think that in both of those cases, there is sort of this gap, particularly as we get into these more um, complex assessment metrics um, that really aren't. I mean, you know, what does it mean to say? Um, I can't. I can think about it off of the top of my head, but some of these metrics that we're using, they actually mean nothing. They mean nothing to a student, and they mean nothing to a, a parent. You know, the ABC model um, is a crude tool, but at least folks have some sense of what that means. And so, I think that. I mean, I think that this the idea behind this uh, uh, this project is to to have a to help. Um, to help teachers communicate it with home, so with parents and students, um, how well students are progressing. Okay. Well, this is the one we've been waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> Your famous tweet, the Code Academy and the future of not learning to code. And uh, I'm I'm going to allow you to <laughs> describe your feelings and what you actually said in that post. <laughs> well, <laughs> and Go ahead. <laughs> well, um let me give some some background here. I'm actually, despite being a technology a technology journalist, I have no programming background other than you know some experiences as a ten year old learning uh, learning basic. I've never taken a computer science class. I've never cracked open a computer science book. I I love talking with talking with um, engineers. I think it's important for me to understand sort of what happens under the hood in technology, but I don't have the skills yet. So I've decided that I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn to code. Um, And I've chosen JavaScript. And there was a startup that launched this summer called Code Academy that was being touted as sort of the new way to learn programming. It's a web-based tool that walks you through incrementally some early lessons in JavaScript. And um, I signed up. I went through all the lessons, and it it didn't teach me anything. Um, and yet, it's become a very popular, um, hyped startup here in Silicon Valley. And on Friday night or thir- Friday night, 
um, the news crossed the wire that they'd raised two point five million dollars, and I, it, <laughs> I took to Twitter with a string of expletives, partially because I think um, I think it's just one of these gross examples of how Silicon Valley gets education and education technology terribly wrong. So if you want to see the actual wording, you'll have to go to the to the to do Audrey's post on this. Um, and so now you've told us about that. How do you really feel? <laughs> well, I mean, I really, you know, I really feel that this is important. I mean, and it's not just. I mean, I think that that we, I think most of us realize that we need to train. We need to help um, everybody have some some skills, some computer skills. And I don't just mean how to use a computer. I mean sort of how to think about how computers work. Like these are the tools that are really more and more dictating how we move through the world. And if it's just a black box that you're afraid to look, um, that you don't know how it works, you're afraid to look um, underneath, look at the code, I think we're going to be in a world of hurt. I think it's important particularly to teach girls and minority youth to um, become interested in science and technology. And so I'm really supportive of tools that make that easy. And Code Academy is not that tool. So this reminds me a lot of the discussion I had with Doug Rushkoff, whose book is called Program or Be Programmed. Yes. Essentially the same idea. These are really, really important technologies. And if we don't teach an understanding of them, then they are just a black box and you're missing something critical. I want to actually segue to something that's related to this but maybe a little bit personal, but I think it's worth discussing. I know that you work really hard to be an independent voice. Mm -hmm. So what's the trap there and, and, and that you're trying to avoid? And can we even describe that as something that, that we should be sort of being aware of? The trap of being an independent voice or of not being independent? No, the trap, the trap that you're avoiding, the trap of getting caught in a place where you cannot be an independent voice. How, okay. how common is that and um, is it something we should be identifying as a trap? I think that – I mean I, I would say that actually Code Academy is a really good example of that. So Code Academy is a startup that's been funded by uh, Y Combinator, which I think most people in the tech world will tell you is the most – um, important and influential technology uh, uh, incubator program. Um, it's also been funded by Union Square Ventures, who are early investors in some of the tools that um, some of the most popular and well-known Web 2.0 tools, uh, Twitter, Etsy. Um, and so these are both really powerful players in Silicon Valley. And I don't ever want to be in a position where I can't, as a writer, speak and say, wow, this is crap. Um, and that is an edited version. Of right. my <laughs> Although it is the right word. It is the right word. <laughs> well, so this is interesting to me because this, I care about sort of the cognitive issues, mm -hmm. but also because I think we're seeing this play out a little in the Occupy movements. Yes. Right. I think there's a questioning of cultural narratives that existed for a long period of time and an interest in saying, uh, you know, which of these have we just sort of gone along with and which actually really makes sense? And which one should we be being critical of? Um, and that's a level of sort of democratic thought that so, sort of intriguingly in our corporate life uh, seems to have a, a little bit uh, – I, I shouldn't give the historical perspective because I don't have it. But it doesn't feel as though our corporate life is as democratic as we would like to believe it is. Uh, and maybe even that our schools don't reflect democracy as much as we teach democracy as a good thing. So, so I'm kind of I wanted to to move from your sort of personal journey to this journey of Occupy, well, the Occupy I, movement. And I would add to that too. And th another piece is that jur that journalists aren't as um, journalists are not as much an independent voice as I think we like to think of the, you know. Um, like to think of journalists as being, you know, objective outside of outside of um, political and corporate influence, and that's just not true either. And I don't, I'm not sure that, that that should be described as malicious, but I think if you work in an environment and and there are these sort of cognitive social pressures that give you reinforcement and reward for for doing what you know the larger motive is, that it's probably very hard to actually step back when your paycheck depends on the organization and say, am I being drawn into a way of thinking 
or am I actually being independent? And and what I've appreciated about your voice is I felt like you have worked to keep yourself independent, both to to call out the positive, but also then to be critical of the negative. Yeah, and I think it you know I think that journalists, uh, the the world of journalism is is also about access. And once you know once you sort of say something unpleasant in the eyes of certain people, they I mean I think that you know people do fear losing access. You fear losing access to sources. Will you get invited to press events? Will people, you know, give you press releases? Will you get briefings? Um, and so I think it's, I think that the stakes are high. Um, I think that, the, the, you know, that for journalism, it's actually very difficult to, to, uh, to sort of speak, to speak out sometimes. Okay. Convince me not to be cynical about another government venture to encourage startups. <laughs> I don't know if I can, Steve. <laughs> but what? I, well, the, the, but back to Occupy. Um, I, I was in I was in New York briefly last week, and I went down to to Occupy Wall Street, and I was struck. And and I and I mentioned this in the wrap up, um, the weekly roundup of news. I was really struck with um, how much education is a core part of the message of the people who are protesting. Um, that's not off. That's not something that you often see um, as being a, a sort of a, one of the fundamental complaints that folks are, have right now um, is, is about education, and I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and so, um, and, and partially around, of course, you know, this is a, a lot of these conversations are about fi- uh, finances and, and corporations, but just the way in which student loan debt um, is a is a is a just an incredible burden for more and more uh, more and more Americans, and so the 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 um, the government's idea to sort of fund entrepreneurs and give them a break on their student loans seems um, uh, timely, <laughs> as that it's an election year. Yeah, I didn't know how to feel about that because in the same breath, we're seeing, uh, and I think you mentioned that tuitions are going up. Yeah. And yet we're going to create a break on the student loans. It it feels as though that cycle of making easy money available has been in part the cause of tuition increases. Yeah. So if you don't actually solve it and you allow for students to continue to accumulate debt or to – you're not actually sort of fundamentally reforming that, are you addressing the issue that, is, that feels like it's this Anya Kamenetz bubble, right. you know, the tuition bubble? No, and I think that – you know, I mean, and, and you know, in, in defense of this program, I do think it's important for us to, um, you know, to help people who graduate from college with debt to be able to do something other than sort of get a job at a big company in order to sort of start paying off their student loans. And I think that, you know, we do suffer as a nation by, uh, by sort of ha- having more barriers to entrepreneurship by the fact that, you know, 22-year-olds have this massive amount of debt when they graduate from college, they're unlikely to start their own business, I think. Uh, they have to get a job and start paying the government back. Um, but yeah, that being said, if we don't actually tackle some of these underlying issues, I mean, you know, tuition is going up. Tuition is going up partially because uh, I think the funding for education, uh, you know, is, is declining, but it's going up all over the board. And as long as you can get a student loan, you know, to cover it, 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 no one seems to be, you know, stopping that train. Yeah, that's a dilemma for me. Um, the Royal Society opens their archives, 60,000 articles. Yes. Um, okay, uh, with, with more and more content coming online, how are we what, – what has to change to allow us to deal with this? Um, how long do you think we'll, we'll have to go through kind of the, uh, a struggle to build ways of coping with just incredible amounts of data? I think that that's a. I think that that's definitely something that we're going to have to tackle. And I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, we we do have all this flood of information. Um, but how are we going to, you know, how do we scale? And we talk a lot in the technology world about scaling this. Um, it's, it's. I feel like we have to start scaling these other connections um, as information is expand as the, our availability of information is is increasing. How do we actually expand and scale? The relationships between students um, and other students, and between students and experts, students and teachers, students and researchers, 
um, so that so that we can move through all of this content in an intelligent way. Is it? Um, do you think that curating will be a part of this? That that role of the curator becomes increasingly pronounced. I think de- def- definitely uh, curation. I think is going to be one of the big um, new things that that we have to think about, and also, you know, thinking about. Um, I mean, in some ways, the internet has been great to sort of shake up expertise. Um, you don't actually have to have, um, you know, be from a major, um, powerful institution to be able to speak your mind and speak your mind intelligently on a subject. So I think that um, curation and how do we, so how do we curate, but how do we also think about expertise works in this new world are going to be big challenges in the coming years. Agreed. Um, I think I'd like to end on the app gap. Yes. Uh, you you wrote a piece for Edutopia. Uh, is it really? I mean, the phrase is, is a is a catchy one. <laughs> it's a good but one. Is huh? is there really a handheld computing gap? And does does is this going to become a narrative that we need to follow in terms of understanding opportunities for students and children? Yeah, this one. I mean, I, my initial reaction to this story was. Um, I was I was I was sort of um, offended because I think that once we shift discussion away from the digital divide to an app gap, um, I, I fear as though we're we're sort of missing the boat with what is still a problem: access to you know broadband, access to computers in general, and understanding digital liter- literacy. Um, it, that that's still a struggle, and so to to talk about. Um, whether or not people have access to an iPad and apps on an iPad as as the issue, when we are still um, there are still homes without broadband, I found that I, I found that a little um, more than a little troubling. I, f- I feel like it's sort of a watering down a conversation that we still need to be having a, a conversation around around uh, access to to computers and the internet. I really appreciate your perspective on that. Um, and as well, I, I am intrigued by the degree to which the handheld device uh, is increasingly defining my own learning. And uh, I, I'll be interested in following that story. Well, what was interesting, actually, is I, um, I sat down that day with, a, um, with Andy Russell, who's the co-founder of a company called Launchpad Toys that make an app called Toontastic, which is an iPad app. And his response was, you know, he and he made actually the great argument on behalf of these handheld devices saying, wait a minute, it is it, you know, the touch screen, the ability for a sort of um, to sort of have uh, the gyroscope within these within these um, apps, you know, for sort of a motion based, you know, bodily learning, um, the, the access to all sorts of other content. So he was making an argument that we really do need to make sure that people have access to these newest devices. And I, I, I can appreciate that, but I still feel as though there's a long way to go just in terms of uh, the digital divide. And I don't want to lose that focus by being concerned that kids can't, you know, kids don't have iPads. Audrey, as usual, fascinating to talk to you. Thanks for your perspective. Thank you. Um, very much fun. And we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.